Hi, I'm Michael Weber, Artistic Director of Chicago's Porchlight Music Theatre. Today we have a unique broadcast from the golden age of radio and an occasion that was the first time three great stars ever worked together as a trio. What makes this episode of the Screen Guild Theatre singular is that this production was one of the rare occasions this series presented, instead of an adaptation of a noteworthy screenplay, a story that was written specially for the radio. The Screen Guild Theatre had a long run, beginning January 8, 1939, lasting for 14 seasons and 527 episodes. The series started with a variety format of songs and sketches, with mixed critical and audience success in its early years. It gained popularity when it increasingly came to rely on adaptations of motion pictures, presenting a considerable challenge to the show's writers, who had to compress the narrative into 22 minutes. Fees the actors would typically charge were donated to the Motion Picture Relief Fund in order to support the creation and maintenance of the Motion Picture Country Home for Retired Actors, which is still in operation today. A 1940 magazine article noted that the Screen Guild Theater was, quote, the only sponsored program on the air which gives all its profits to charity, unquote. The first three seasons of the CBS series were sponsored by Gulf Oil. With uncertainties in the oil market due to World War II, Gulf dropped the show, and in 1942, the Chicago cosmetics firm Lady Esther Corporation assumed sponsorship. The Lady Esther Screen Guild Theater was consistently one of the top ten radio programs during its run. The popularity of Lady Esther Cosmetics began to wane in the middle 1940s, which led the company to withdraw sponsorship in 1947, at which time Camel Cigarettes purchased a three-year contract. Changing time slots and networks brought about a decline in ratings, and in the fall of 1950, the series returned to CBS, where it ran until its final broadcast, June 29, 1952, with an adaptation of the film Over 21, starring Irene Dunn with McDonald Carey. During its total run, the Screen Guild Theater earned a total of $5,235,607 for the Motion Picture Relief Fund, the equivalent of over $54 million today. Today's writers, M.M. Musselman and Kenneth Earle, had mutual credits contributing to screenplays such as The Bride Came C.O.D., starring James Cagney and Betty Davis in 1941, Mr. Lucky, starring Cary Grant in 1943, and Bathing Beauty in 1944, starring Red Skelton and Esther Williams. Their work here was their first writing for this episode's three stars. As mentioned earlier, programs like the Screen Guild Theater, as well as Screen Directors Playhouse, Lux Radio Theater, the Cresta Blanca Hollywood Players, and others, rarely presented original radio plays. But that is exactly what we have for you now, and starring three performers at the height of their careers— Bing Crosby was in the top ten Hollywood moneymakers in 1940. Bob Hope would reach the same heights in 1941, the year of our broadcast, and Betty Grable would join this elite list the following year. Here they all are, together creating roles in a brand new musical comedy written especially for radio and presented on the February 23, 1941 episode of the Screen Guild Theater entitled... Alter Bound. Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, Betty Grable. The Gulf Screen Guild Theater. Your host, the director of the star's own theater, Roger Pryor. Good evening, everyone. 
Your neighborhood good golf dealer and the Gulf Oil Companies welcome you to the Gulf Screen Guild Theater. Tonight is comedy night in the Gulf Theater, and what a cast we have for you. Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, and Betty Grable. You'll hear all three of these favorite stars in the most screwball comedy of the season, Alter Bound, a brand new farce by M.M. Musselman and Kenneth Earle. Our music will be by Oscar Bradley's Gulf Orchestra with Frank Tours conducting. We have a moment before Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, and Betty Grable appear on the stage and take their positions before the Gulf microphones. So I'd like to ask you if you remember the last time you picked out a family automobile. You didn't just go to the nearest car dealers and take whatever came handy. No, sir. You looked into the whole business pretty carefully because, among other desirable features, you wanted a car that would perform well, that was a real pleasure to drive. Well, as we all know, but sometimes forget... Selecting the car itself is only the first step in getting the best possible performance. It's just as important to select a good fuel for the motor of that car. And that's why we suggest that instead of just stopping at any gasoline pump, you stop at your neighborhood good Gulf dealers. Gulf no-knox gasoline gives you quick starting even in the coldest weather. Plus, high mileage and smooth, top-notch performance. Along with other fine Gulf products, Gulf no-knox is the choice of prize-winning automobile drivers and of thousands of everyday car owners. So to make sure the car you selected gives you the performance you expect of it, make sure the gasoline you select is Gulf (laughs) No-Knox. That applause, ladies and gentlemen, is the audience's greeting to our stars who are now entering from the wings. There's the downbeat and the opening theme of the Gulf Theater production of Alterbound. You hear Bing Crosby as Ted, an out-of-work actor. Bob Hope as Hank, his also-not-doing-so-well pal. And Betty Grable as the girl. As the scene opens, Hank and Ted are sitting on a park bench staring hungrily at a flock of pigeons circling in front of them. Hey, gee, those pigeons are nice and fat, aren't they? Yeah. Why don't we wait around till after dark and slip one of them a hot foot? (laughs) Say, to hear you talk, Ted, anyone would think we aren't doing too well. What about last night? Wasn't that a swell room we had at the Waldorf Astoria? Wonderful. What a dinner we had, boy, with those waiters and white coats and everything. Yeah, and then breakfast in bed this morning. Yeah. Squab on toast, poached eggs, marmalade. Yeah. Give me a drag on that before you throw it away, will you? (laughs) Hey, Hank. Take a look at that guy throwing those edibles at the birds. Throwing those what at the who? Those edibles. Food. Here we are, starving. What do you have to do to get somebody to throw that stuff at us, I wonder? I'll tell you what, let's climb that tree over there and make like we're going to Capistrano. <laughs> you know, Hank, for a guy that hasn't had any food in two days, you're in pretty good spirits. Yeah, well, Ted, I've been holding out on you. What? You remember yesterday when I found that Sunday newspaper? Yeah. I ate it. <laughs> Not the funny paper, too. Yeah, let's see Dick Tracy get out of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you could have saved me the race results. <laughs> I use that for a napkin. <laughs> and the weather report for a finger bowl. Hey, Hank. Look at those two guys there. Look at them. The ones that just got out of the cab. Yeah, top hat, Prince Albert, and striped trousers. They look like something that just stepped out of Esquire. They got men in Esquire, too? <laughs> <laughs> I don't look that far. Shh. Say, they're coming over to ward us. I, I beg your pardon, but... But uh, look, if you two guys are undertakers, we're not ready yet. Uh, we just want to find out if you fellows would like to make a hundred bucks. A hundred bucks? Let them up, Ted. We'll take the job. You just pick out the river, we'll get the bag and the cement. <laughs> now look, fellas, time. You have a hundred bucks that belongs to us. What do we have to do to get it? Well, we want to play a joke on a friend of ours. See, he's getting married at that big church at 49th Street. Never mind, want... never mind all the preliminaries, friend. What do we have to do? Well, we want you to go to this church, see, and then right in the middle of the wedding ceremony, you go up to the... Now, Don Carlos Gonzalez and John Marwick... Before I pronounce you man and wife... Stop! You can't say stop. This is the wedding, Ma. Okay, company halt. What's 
the meaning of this? Is this the woman, my good man? That's her, officer. That's her. That's Bertha the bigamist, the woman who betrayed me. <gasps> I never saw him in my life. There's some mistake, Carlos. Carlos, believe me. Oh, my goodness, he's passed out. He's fainted, miss. And you won't get a chance to poison this one, you, you, you husband poisoner, you. Husband poisoner? Yes, according to our records, you poisoned seven husbands. Killed six and gave one an awful stomach ache. <laughs> you belong on Hobby Lobby. <laughs> I don't know what you hyenas are up to, but you won't get away with now, it. Now, don't lose your temper, Bertha. I'll forgive you for the sake of our children. Children? Eight. You remember? No, six. I said eight. Well, if you want to count the one with the two heads. <laughs> <laughs> it's a frame-up. I'm innocent, I tell you, innocent. Oh, that's what they all say. Come along with us, Bertha the bigamist. Let me go. Let me go, I tell you. Well, here we are, fellas. We're back, and here's your little bride. Gee, she's not a bad dish, either. Yeah, I wish this was dish night. <laughs> <laughs> now, about the hundred, fellas. Uh, uh, what are you fellas staring at? That's the wrong one. Yeah, we don't know this girl. What? Well, look, look, fellas. We went to the 48th Street Church, just like you said. 48th and... Street? We said 49th Street. Oh, oh, oh come on. We better beat it before we get in trouble. Hey, hey, how about that C-note? Cowards! Well, now suppose you boys tell me what it's all about. Well, it's a long, dull, and very uninteresting story. Yeah, you see, You we... aren't really a detective, are you? No, you see, we were sitting on... Impersonating an officer, eh? Oh, I, I wouldn't call it that. It was just a little... And bit... kidnapping. Now, wait, wait a minute here. You don't have to rub it in. You know you ruined our chances of making a hundred bucks. A hundred bucks? And I ruined your chances. Yeah, I bet you feel like a heel, don't you? <laughs> a hundred bucks? Why, you no good low-down cinder-brained baboon. I was marrying Don Carlos Gonzalez, the South American coffee planter. Oh, that's nothing. What's that? I know a lot of them coffee guys. I knew Maxwell before he had a house. <laughs> a million dollars worth of South American gentlemen. A million dollars worth. And now I'll have to go back to the chorus. Third from the end. Third from the end? I thought those legs looked familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Bertha, the bigamist. Husband poisoner. And you were going to send me to jail. Oh, we were only kidding. Well, I'm not. Police! Help! Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait, we'll do anything you want. Don't call the police. Yeah, yeah, we'll even go back to the church. We'll explain everything. Honest, we'll do anything you say. Well, okay. Let's hurry back to the church, and I'll try to talk Carlos out of killing you. Okay, sister. And you either better be good at talking or or good at digging. I'm sorry, but Mr. Gonzalez was carried out by some friends. Maybe he's in one of the bars down the street. Well? He was carried out of there, too. We've covered almost every bar within a mile square. Why don't we try just this last one, huh? What do you have, folks? Don Carlos Gonzalez. You tell me the ingredients and I'll mix it. (laughs) It isn't a drink. It's a man, tall, dark, and very smooth. It still sounds like a drink. Well, have you seen him? I don't know. Uh, There was one fella that said his wedding was... That's the guy, that's him. Oh, well, he said something about taking a plane back to South America. Well, did he go to the airport? I don't know. When he left here, he was high enough to meet the plane personally. Transcontinental sleeper leaves in five minutes. Passengers will please go through gate number five. Hey, hey, mister. Where does the plane leave for South America? It just left. Yeah, well, who was on it besides Wilkie? (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, we tried anyhow, Hank. Listen, Joan, believe me, if we had the money, we'd go to South America to square things for you. You can. What do you mean, we can? Well, Carlos reserved a suite on the SS Southern Cross. We were going on a South American cruise for our honeymoon. Oh, wait a minute. We can't go on a trip with you. Why not? The boat leaves tonight. We can claim the stateroom. Oh, I couldn't think of it. I haven't even picked out my trousseau. <laughs> what would Emily say? Of course not. We can't do a crazy thing no. like that. Why, we'll never get away with it. Never. We won't go on that honeymoon with you. No. We won't go. Help, police! Help! Okay, okay, we'll go, we'll go. See, for a moment, I was afraid I'd talked her out of it. <laughs> Somebody's at the stateroom door. Must be the steward. Quick, Ted, get in the closet. Oh, I've been in that closet so much I call the Maws by their first name. 
Well, go on in there and get their draft numbers. Go on, get in there. <laughs> Remember, I'm the husband and you're the stowaway. Okay, okay, gee where? Oh, gee. Come in. Good morning, good morning. Uh, Captain's compliments. He always sends a cake to the occupants of the bridal suite. Oh, thank you, Stuart. It's very thoughtful of him, but, well, he shouldn't have gone to all this trouble for us. Oh, it was no trouble, madam. He really had the cake made for another couple, but it turned out to be a fraud. So he sent them to jail and the cake to you. Yes. Well, from the looks of that cake, I think they got the best of it. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. But if there's anything else you wish, just ask for it. If you don't mind, Stuart, would you please get some ice water? Uh, yes, madam. You know, I've attended this honeymoon suite for 87 trips, and I make a point... Very interesting, the... Stuart. Get some ice water. Yes, madam. You know, if I may say so, you're a very strange honeymoon couple, uh, standing so far apart. Yes, well, you see, we, uh, we married each other for our money. <laughs> Here. <laughs> now, now, don't be bashful in front of me. Uh, go ahead now, kiss your little bride. Oh, shucks. Uh, go ahead now. Now, 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 get closer. That's right. Now, a, a little closer. Now, kiss her. <clears throat> now, what do you say, sir? Never mind the water. Just bring the ice. <laughs> What a benefit. <laughs> okay, Ted, you can come out. Now, look here, Hank. You've been taking advantage of a situation. You had no business kissing Joan. Well, I was forced into it. That darn steward forced me into it. Bless him. <laughs> well, then it's my turn to be forced into it. Well, I'm not superstitious, but three and a kiss, that's practically sending an invitation to trouble. Oh, well, pardon me while I go in the next room and throw a few grains of salt over my shoulder. <laughs> the big man, he's always bragging about his strength. Now, now, Ted, mustn't sulk. Well, it's no more than right. Gee, we're partners in this thing, and if you kiss Hank, well, well you've got to kiss me. Oh, you big baby. All right, here's a kiss for you, too. Uh, I'm back with your ice water, sir, so I, uh... Oh, well! <laughs> Better get a little more ice. <laughs> well, I, I, the, the minute your husband's back is turned and in my honeymoon suite. Now, hold on here a minute. You got this thing all wrong, pal. I'm an old friend. Mm -hmm. Just happened to be passing by, so, uh, so I thought I'd drop in for a minute. Passing by? My dear sir, this is a ship. Well, I came by in a grapefruit rind off the Queen Mary. <laughs> Well, well, you can't pull the wool over my eyes. You won't get away with it, sir. I, I'll tell her husband. Yes, sir, that's what I'll do. I, 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 I'll tell her husband. Say, what's all the noise? What's going on in here? Oh, it's terrible, sir. I just opened this door and found this strange man kissing your wife and in my honeymoon cabin. Oh, but don't worry, don't worry. I'll tell him plenty. Yes, sir, I'll tell him plenty. Okay, but not too loud, will you? I want to take a nap. <laughs> I know. Look, I'm, I'm going to tell the captain about this. I'm... Oh, Hank. What is it, Ted? Remember what you said about inviting trouble? Yes. Well, it just accepted the invitation. Well, there goes Act One, and I can promise you that Act Two will be even more hilarious. See for yourself. Because our curtain will rise again in just a few seconds, during which... Bud Heaston has a little story for you. You know, folks, if I could only give a really sinister laugh like those you hear in detective dramas, that's what I do to start off my story tonight because it's the case of the pool in the driveway. One sunny morning in Pennsylvania, a man came out of his house and as he crossed his driveway, suddenly stopped short. For there, glistening in the sunlight, was a large pool of oil just where a relative had parked his car the night before. Naturally worried, the Pennsylvanian telephoned to find out how much damage had been done. To his surprise, he discovered that although all that oil had leaked from the crankcase, Gulf Pride's super tough film had remained to take the car 12 risky miles without damage to the engine. That's just another example of the marvelous quality of Gulf Pride motor oil. For Gulf Pride is no ordinary motor oil. You see, it's made differently, refined by the famous Alclor process that Gulf alone uses. This extra refining step removes up to 20% more of the easy oxidizers found in many other premium oils, makes Gulf Pride exceptionally resistant to air. That means that Gulf Pride forms less carbon, sludge, and varnish, stays up to the mark longer, vaporizes more slowly, lubricates better. So why not get Gulf Pride motor oil tomorrow from your neighborhood Good Gulf dealer? 
Hi, this is Porchlight's Production and Operation Director, Alex Ryan. Thank you for listening to WPMT. If you value programming like this, please consider making a donation today to Porchlight Music Theater at porchlightmusictheater.org. We appreciate your consideration, and we hope you enjoy the show. The Curtain of the Gulf Theater rises on the second act of Alderbound, adapted for radio by Sam Perrin, and starring Bob Hope as Hank, Bing Crosby as Ted, and Betty Grable as Joan. It's a short time later in the honeymoon suite of the South America-bound liner. The steward has gone in search of the captain to report finding Joan, who he thinks is Hank's wife, in the arms of a strange man. As our scene opens, Ted, the stowaway, is playing tunes on some half-filled glasses with a spoon as Hank and Joan sit dejectedly awaiting the arrival of the captain. Gosh, I wonder what the captain will do to us. Maybe he'll put us in the brig. Maybe he'll make us walk the plank. Maybe he'll tie us up on the yard arm. Was your mother frightened by Charles Lawton? <laughs> hey, for heaven's sake, Ted, would you stop playing around with those glasses? Who do you think you are, Barrymore? <laughs> we need you to... <laughs> We, uh, I wish you'd do a little worrying with us. Besides, that G-sharp's a little flat. What have I got to worry about? I'm a stowaway, and I'll admit it. So what? If they find me, the worst they can do is put me to work. Say, that's right. Then what are we worrying about? Sure. Joan and I got nothing to worry about. After all, you're the fraud, you know. Yeah. Me? Sure. You said you were Gonzales, didn't you? Yes, but I... You aren't Gonzales, are you? No, but... Look, Ted. Ted, we gotta do something. Now, look, you've got brains. Go ahead. Break them in. <laughs> Wait a minute, Ted, will you? Quiet, quiet, I got it. You have? What is it? Listen here. It was fiesta down in Mexico And so I stopped a while to see the show I knew that frenesy meant please love me And I could say frenesy A lovely senorita caught my eye I stood enchanted as she wandered by And never knowing that it came from me, I gently sighed, frenesy. She stopped and raised her eyes to mine. She was longing to be kissed. Her eyes were soft as candle shine. So how was I to resist? And now without a heart to call my own, a greater happiness I've never known. Because her kisses are for me alone Who wouldn't say frenesy Oh, that's a great country, that Mexico, Hank You know, I had some free holies down there one afternoon Late in the afternoon A wonderful bunch of free holies You recognize that stuff? Where are we? Oh, okay, Romeo, back to the closet All right, all right, I'm going, don't push Come in Oh, it's you, Captain. This is an unexpected pleasure. Thank you. I came to apologize for the steward. From what he told me, I'm sure he must have annoyed you with his silly superstitions. Oh, the steward. Oh, the steward. Amusing chap. A chap? Uh, It's old-fashioned. By the way, you're supposed to be South American. Where did you pick up such good English? In a pool room. Uh, Yes, in a... (laughs) What? (laughs) Uh, Where did that voice come from? Oh, yes, that voice. That's just one of my little jokes. I used to be a ventriloquist in vaudeville. That joke was part of my routine. But vaudeville has been dead for years. What do you think killed it? (laughs) (laughs) Very amusing little trick. Yes, I'm clever, isn't he? (laughs) You know, when I stopped outside your cabin, I heard you sing. You really have a very fine voice. Thank you, sir. (laughs) Very clever, the way you throw your voice into that closet. Yes, for two pins, I'd throw it through the (laughs) porthole. No, I'm not a suspicious man, Mr. Gonzalez. Of course you're not, Cap. Let me hear you sing. Yes, well, we get... You did what? I... I say, let me hear you sing. Yes, that's, that's fine. I'll tell him when he comes in. I'd like to, uh, <laughs> I'd, uh, just, uh, I'd like to oblige, Captain, but my voice is changing. Your voice changing on your honeymoon? Yes, you see, I didn't have time for it when I was a boy. <laughs> <laughs> now, quit stalling and let me hear you sing. Oh, but, Captain, let's not rush into this thing. After all, you can't expect a man to sing just like that these days. First, I have to clear my throat, and then I have to clear the song. <laughs> All right. (laughs) I 
I'm certainly going to have a look in this closet. Now, Captain, don't you do something I'll be sorry for. Get away from that closet. There's no one in there but my ventriloquist dummy. Take my word for it, Captain. There's nothing in there but a dummy. And I'll open this door and see for myself. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Gosh, that was a narrow escape. Oh, Ted. Ted, you can come out of the closet now. Hank, put down that vase. Quiet, Joan. I want to try it on for size. Ted! <laughs> come on out, Theodore, dear. I can't. I'm sitting up with a sick moth. <laughs> oh, Hank, we'll never find Gonzalez if you boys don't cooperate. The boat docks in Rio in a couple of minutes, and you've got to be ready to slip off. Okay, come on out, Ted. But I still think it was a dirty trick. How'd you like to be kept in the closet all the time? Wait, Ted, where'd you get that new suit? New suit? Yeah, you went in with a blue suit, now you're wearing a pepper and salt suit. Those is the eating as maws I have <laughs> Say, I hope Joan's in her cabin. Won't she be excited when we tell her the news? Yeah, I'm sure glad we found that Gonzales, too. Pretty place down here, though, isn't it? You know, this is the real rumba country, eh? Yeah, where did that dance come from? Rumba? Oh, that was invented by a chicken trying to hatch a hot potato. <laughs> yeah, well, take my advice, Ted. If you see a girl doing the rumba down here, don't try to pick up her handkerchief until she drops it. Good tip. <laughs> well, here's the cabin. Who is it? It's me. It's us. Yeah, it's him, too. I kept the door locked for fear someone would come in and ask more questions. It's a good thing, too. I just saw Clifton Fadiman sneaking along the hall. <laughs> Say, you've got nothing to worry about now, Joan. We found Gonzalez. Yeah, he said he'd wait till we brought you to him, and that's just what we're going to do. What do you say now, Joanie? Come on, powder up your pretty little face. Let's get going, huh? Uh, I'm not going. Oh, Joan, you got to. We traveled 6,000 miles. Passed Eleanor four times. Besides, you love him. <laughs> Don't you? You said you did. <laughs> Told me. I thought I did. Well, but I'm in love with two other fellas. Huh? We thought we were only kidding when we called you Bertha the Bigamist, huh? Yeah, why don't you love Carlos, too, and you can be Tessie the Trigamist? <laughs> Joan. Yes, Ted? You know, I, I'm really kind of glad you changed your mind about Gonzales. He's a swell guy and everything, but... But, you know, you can't go on being in love with two other fellas. You've got to choose between them. I wish I could, Ted, but... Well, I just can't hurt the other one. No, oh, she's trying to make it as light for you as she can, Ted. Do you yeah. see what she's driving at? Yeah, I, I see what she's driving at. Yeah, and that's really something when you can see what a woman is driving at. <laughs> Come in. Carlos! Oh, my little chiquita, I couldn't have wait any longer. Come fly with me. Fly away with me. Uh, now he thinks he's Superman. <laughs> wait, wait, Carlos. I have something to tell you. I don't know how to say it, but... Well, I'm in love with someone else. What? Yep, Carlos, that's me. Sorry, it's a tough break. You keep all of this. So, you have been toying with my car, you No, know, huh? Carlos. And now you are tossing it around like a feather in the breeze. It tickles you, doesn't it? <laughs> break it up, Gonzalez. I want to have a little talk with you. Step into my office. I want to talk to you. I wonder what Hank wants to say to him. Well, I'm back. Oh, I almost forgot to tell you. Carlos fell off the boat. <laughs> uh-huh, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> and you're right. <laughs> How could Carlos fall off the boat? Well, I was playing yo-yo with him and his necktie broke <laughs> Oh, that's ridiculous We would have heard a splash Well, you know, this is a very high deck Hmm, <laughs> a belly flopper <laughs> Forgot to point his toes, I guess Oh, close the door, Hank Close the door I can't bear to hear him scream now, well, it's a fine mess. Fine mess now. We'll be headed back for the States soon, and things are worse than when we started. Open this door. Open this door, young lady. I just had a talk with Gonzalez. There's our trouble now. There it is. It's the captain. Who said that? My dummy. Besides, where did you see Carlos? I was fishing. <laughs> well, don't expect me for dinner. <laughs> Tell that dummy to shut up and open this door, or I'll break it down. Oh, Ted, Ted, I'm worried about you. If they find you, they'll probably make you wash dishes the rest, rest of the trip. And you're worried about Ted. The worst he can get is dishpan hands. What about me? I'll get thrown in the brig. <laughs> Hank. Yeah? Hank, I'm in love with Ted. No. I know how you feel about it, but... Well, that's how I feel about it. I don't want to hurt you, Hank, because... Gee, I think you're swell. I want to keep you as a friend, and... Well, someday I... I know you'll meet the one girl who will mean the world to you. And when that day comes, 
we'll all be together again. So buck up, Hank. You've got broad shoulders. You can take it. Oh, shut up! Well, what are you going to do, Hank? I've got everything figured out, Joan. Get in the closet, Ted, and leave everything to me. Thanks, Hank. You're a real pal. Oh, it's nothing. I'll take it. Okay, I'm coming. Well? Hiya, Cap. Glad to see you. You won't be when you hear what I've got to say. You're not married. Oh, that's ridiculous. And everyone concerned with this hoax will be thrown in the brig. What's the use of arguing so much, Captain? You've got the authority. If you don't believe we're married, just marry us all over again. What? Yes, that's a splendid now, idea. Now, wait a minute, you double cross. Now, now, snooky yucky. You don't want to get thrown in the eggy briggy. <laughs> <laughs> just stand right over here. That's right. Now, do you take this woman for your lawful wedded wife? Well, I... Uh, uh, huh? Who was that? Oh, that was your dummy, remember, dear? Oh, yes, my dummy. You know, I haven't painted him up for a long time. I think I'll go in the closet and give him a good shellacking. <laughs> go ahead with the ceremony, Captain. Uh, yes, and you, young lady, do you take this man for your lawful wedded husband? She does. She doesn't. I do. I want a divorce. <laughs> My good man, if you want a divorce, you must get married first. They certainly make it tough, don't they? <laughs> Quiet, please. Now, if I'm not interrupting, I pronounce you man and wife. Ted, Ted, we're married. No. Ted, Ted, what's that noise? Come on, they're throwing rice at me. <laughs> <laughs> Ted, what does this mean? Who is Ted? Oh, that's all right, Captain. Ted's my middle name. Well, then, what's the dummy's name? Oh, from now on, it's Hank. Thanks, Hank. Oh, that's all right, Joan. I can take it. I've got broad shoulders. I don't want to hurt you, Joan, because I think you're swell. I want to keep you as a friend, and someday I'll meet the one girl who will mean the world to me. And, and when that day comes, we'll all be together again. Perhaps you think I'm a fool. Well, maybe I am. Yes, I am a fool. <laughs> makes you talk like that. I'm a sucker for a violin. <laughs> I'm sure all of us agree that Bing Crosby... Bob Hope and Betty Grable well deserve that enthusiastic applause from our Gulf Screen Guild Theater audience. As you know, this was their first appearance together on the air, and they were all splendid. The Gulf Theater is the only place on your dial where you can hear casts like ours tonight. For this is the star's own program. In return for their appearances, the Gulf Oil Companies give generously to the Motion Picture Relief Fund for all its worthy charities. We're thankful for your enthusiasm for our cause and your loyalty to our program. Ladies and gentlemen, we're proud to announce for next week one of the most exciting shows of the season. Betty Davis and Brian Ahern in the Gulf Screen Guild Theater production of Jane Eyre, Charlotte Bronte's immortal story of a love overshadowed by a strange mystery, starring Betty Davis in the title role and Brian Ahern as her employer. Week after next, another great comedy you've been waiting for. Fibber McGee and Molly and Merle Oberon and one of the funniest stories you've ever heard. Don't miss it. Until then, this is Roger Pryor saying good night for your neighborhood good golf dealer. Bob Hope and Bing Crosby will soon be seen in the Paramount picture Road to Zanzibar. Betty Grable is now working at 20th Century Fox on Miami. Make a date with your dial for next Sunday night. Don't miss Betty Davis and Brian Ahern in Jane Eyre. But he's been speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Bing Crosby was born Harry Lillis Crosby in Spokane, Washington, May 3, 1903. Crosby left Washington for Los Angeles in 1925, where he joined Paul Whiteman's orchestra and became one-third of a singing trio, the Rhythm Boys.
Crosby made his solo radio debut over CBS on September 2, 1931. By 1936, he had become a major recording star and the host of NBC's Craft Music Hall, a weekly showcase for his casual manner, self-deprecating humor, and mellifluous singing voice. In 1946, Crosby became the first radio star to embrace the new technology of recording tape. When Kraft and NBC balked at the idea of pre-recording shows, Crosby left the Kraft Music Hall for ABC Radio and the transcribed Philco Radio Time. The show's success ushered in a new era of pre-recorded programming. Crosby moved to CBS in 1949, starring on various series and the annual Christmas Sing with Bing, where he always found time to perform his biggest hit, Irving Berlin's White Christmas. His final radio show was a daily program with longtime friend Rosemary Clooney, which aired until 1962. Bob Hope is recognized as the most honored entertainer by the Guinness Book of World Records. The show business legend was born Leslie Towns Hope in England on May 29, 1903. Hope's family moved to Cleveland when he was two. As a young boy, he worked part-time jobs before focusing on a vaudeville career, and he toured the country as a performer with a series of sidekicks. Taking the advice of friends, he eventually began performing as a stand-up comedian. The one-man act was such a success that he was able to form his own company in Chicago and later moved to New York to begin his radio career. Bob Hope first appeared on the radio show The Intimate Review in 1935 before starting The Pepsodent Show on September 27, 1938. The show was a huge success, attracting regular guest stars such as Frank Sinatra, Judy Garland, and Betty Hutton. During World War II, Bob Hope focused his energy on entertaining U.S. troops around the world. In doing so, he established himself as one of the most popular and beloved entertainers of the 20th century. Born Elizabeth Ruth Grable, December 18, 1916, and launching to stardom in the Broadway musical Do Barry Was a Lady in 1939, Betty Grable reigned in the Quigley Poll's Top Ten Box Office Stars, a feat only matched by Doris Day, Julia Roberts, and Barbara Streisand, although all were surpassed by silent star Mary Pickford, who was in it 13 times. The U.S. Treasury Department in 1946 and 47 listed Betty Grable as the highest salaried woman in America. In addition to her stage and film work, she was a hugely popular guest on variety, comedy, and dramatic radio programs during the Golden Age, including appearances on a diverse variety of shows, including Command Performance, Suspense, Lux Radio Theater, and G.I. Journal, as well as appearances on both Bob Hope and Bing Crosby's own shows. Theaters across the country need your support now, more than ever. We hope you'll consider a donation to Porchlight Music Theater today. Just go to porchlightmusictheater.org. Until next time on Classic Musicals from the Golden Age of Radio... I'm Michael Weber.